And then Carl opened his eyes and got a good look at the lioness who had actually saved him from the first lion. Now, what's, what's the reason that she did it, he wondered. Maybe she wants to eat me instead. But no, he looked and he recognized that it was Nell. Nell was a lioness who he had named when he had helped her a couple of years ago when she had cubs and then got very, very sick. And he had found her, they had found her out laying there near her cubs, almost, almost near death. And they put her in the cage and took her back and took the cubs back and he had nursed Nell back to life given her water, given her medicine, fed her, and taken care of her cubs, given them milk to drink. And then when Nell got better after several weeks, they took Nell back out into the safari bush area and they put her loose and they put her cubs beside her and they left. And Nell had never forgotten what he had done and recognized right away who it was that that first lioness had attacked and was standing on top of it. You know, animals have feelings and they remember things too, don't they? Now, I don't know if you probably don't have a lioness, but you might have a cat or a dog or a chicken or a, or a ger gerbil or a guinea pig or something. Those animals care about how you treat them and they know if you are treating them good or if you're ignoring them or being mean to them. We want to be just like Jesus would be, with our animals as well. And we want to treat them kindly and good. And it probably won't mean that one of those will save your life. In fact, I don't think you'll ever have a lioness standing on top of you. But Nell saved Carl's life just like he had saved hers. And even if they don't save our lives, they still remember and they know that we care. So be very good to your pets and know that they appreciate it and like being around you and like it when you are kind to them as well. All right? Thanks for being good here this morning. I'll let you go back to your seats right now. Thank you, Pastor Moore. Chris, do you have a ministry moment or a health nugget for us? Hey, good morning again. So my health nuggets, um, I don't know if anybody's picked up on it yet, but I've been trying to find ways to use natural foods to cure some of the problems, issues that our bodies have these days. Um, we did the... Um, the, na the nuts and certain, I think it was grapes and stuff, that if you have trouble sleeping at night, that if you eat those things, it will help you to sleep better. And then we did the celery, which has a lot of healing properties and a lot of um, good things for us if we eat celery. So this month, I picked bananas. Um, I like bananas. I eat a banana every day. I didn't realize the, the many health um, things there are about bananas um, until I started looking these up. So you all will be getting um, a handout. We need them up here on the platform too. Levi, could you bring them up here? So the first page, amazing benefits of bananas. They can give you energy. Did anybody know that you can eat a banana? It'll give you energy? I didn't know that. But it'll give you energy. Um, it says it replaces the muscle glycogen, muscle sugar, that's used when you're exercising or doing anything strenuous. So it replaces it, and it helps to give you more energy. They're full of potassium that, help, that helps with the um, circulatory system, delivers oxygen to the brain, um, helps maintain regular heartbeat and proper water balance in the body. Um, they contain B6, regulates blood glucose levels, and helps us in times of stress, and helps us to suppress cranky moods. 
<laughs> that must be what helps me in the morning because I eat banana for breakfast every day. I, I'm not a morning person. <laughs> so, okay, so um, they can help. Um, they're high, high insoluble fiber, which helps stop constipation and helps to restore and maintain regular bowel function. Um, they can increase happiness. Bananas release a mood-regulating substance called tryptophan, which is converted to serotonin in the brain and thus elevates mood and makes us happier. Um, it can help smokers to quit. They contain B vitamins and other minerals that lessen the effects of nicotine withdrawal, both physically and psychologically. And um, they have iron. They um, help individuals that have anemia. Um, Iron-rich foods such as bananas help stimulate production of hemoglobin in the blood. And brain power. Potassium-packed fruit helps learning because it makes the pupils more alert. Students find that they have more brain power and do better on exams when they eat bananas at breakfast and lunch. Um, so, Again, they're good for lasting energy, brain function, blood circulation, regular bowel movements, regulate blood sugar, reduce stomach acid, menstrual relief, in, um, increasing iron, gives you a happy mood, and they're healthy, and it's one of God's natural foods. It's not a pill that a scientist created that can be harmful and have side effects. So um, there's more information on these. That's why I've been, I decided to print them out. And there's extras I'll put out on the glass case if you want to take one to somebody else. But um, again, the last page shows that it can reduce uh, blood, help your blood pressure, um, helps nerve and muscle functions, and it says the fiber in bananas keep digestion regular and helps maintain low blood sugar curbs overeating. So it can even help with weight loss. So natural foods, bananas. Start eating them. Thank you. How many like bananas? Yeah, I like bananas too. I remember somebody telling me that, well, I've tried it now. You take a banana and instead of, you know, you, at the top, you try to peel it from the top. But if you turn it over and you peel it there, it peels easier. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Try it sometime. Make sure you eat the banana too, right? How many of you brought your Bibles? Hold them up. I believe this is an inspired word of God. How about you? Amen. Our, our scripture reading today is Psalms 105. Psalms 105, we'll be reading verses 1 through 8. Psalms 105. In the middle of your Bible there. And we'll read, be reading verses 1 through 8. Say amen when you're there. Is it? All right. And it reads, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him. Sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O seed of Abraham, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. And now, Pastor Moore. Thank you. Well, it's good to be with you again today. Are you glad to be in church today? Glad for the Sabbath, aren't we? A day of rest in many ways, physically and spiritually as well. This morning, we are looking at uh, 
the Sabbath where we have a holiday coming just down the road, don't we? Thanksgiving holiday. And uh, some of you will go away, some of you will have people coming in, and others of you will do other things probably that are special on that day. But it's one of the days that uh, in a special way we stop and we give thanks to the Lord for what he has done and is doing and continues to do for us, as well as remembering other things. So we're going to look at that this morning a little bit. But as we do that, uh, I want to invite you just to go to God's throne again in prayer with me as we start. Father, we thank you so much for your promise to meet with us. We do come to you with praise in our hearts. You have blessed us in many ways, and we are thankful for that. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the Spirit's guidance in our lives. And today I would ask that you would bless as we spend some time thinking about these things that we'll be looking at today, that we might hear from you in our hearts and in our service, that you would bless my words and our understanding and speak to us with just that which we need individually today. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, one of the things that uh, I used to Loved to do when I was back in seminary. That's a long time ago. I went to college at Andrews University, came back and went to seminary at Andrews University after a year out in the field and doing ministry in Wisconsin. But one of the things that I enjoyed doing periodically, you know, not every, every week necessarily, but I enjoyed going out to Lake Michigan and seeing the uh, waves and the beaches and the things that are there. Um, you know, it, being here in Centerville, I know you've been there as well. It's not very far from where we are, is it, in terms of driving? But I especially enjoyed and, and looked back on the times when I went out there just after or maybe even as a part of some big storm that had come. Like to see the waves. I don't know that the sailors like to see those or the swimmer, swimmers, maybe some surfer or something. But, uh, you know, Michigan, Lake Michigan is a big lake, and uh, it does have some pretty good-sized waves, but when you get a storm on the lake, things that are even more impressive take place. And it was very interesting to look at those huge waves come in at times, sometimes with little rain or sometimes right after the storm or high winds had blown. Um, and while I was there, uh, in the uh, school there, the Benton Harbor newspaper came out one time with a story that I still remember. Uh, it was the story of one of the tragic boat wrecks on Lake, Mich on Lake Michigan. It happened in the late 1800s, or 1860 actually is when it happened. And it was of a ship called the Lady Elgin. The Lady Elgin was out on Lake Michigan going from Milwaukee to Chicago when a tremendous storm came up. She had uh, four to 500 passengers on board, crew and passengers on the ship at that time. And the waves came up, the clouds rolled in, and the fog, and you couldn't see anything out in this storm. And in the middle of the storm, a schooner, a great big uh, sailing ship with three or four massive sails on it, was sailing through the storm at the same time, did not know the Lady Elgin was there, and was moving at a pretty good clip with all the winds up and trying to make some time, and through the waves, and it struck the Lady Elgin broadside right in the side of the ship, and actually hit it so hard that the two ships for a period of time, stuck together and did not pull apart. They were united as the uh, schooner that had come into the side of the Lady Elgin had crashed in and got wedged in there and could not get itself out. And things went very fast, went downhill very fast. Uh, it, it took a little while, and you know, the crew and everybody's looking, but... Uh, after a period of time, I don't know exactly how long it was, but after a period of time, finally the winds and the waves tore that schooner out of the side of the Lady Elgin, and within 30 minutes of the time that it had been hit, 
the Lady Elgin with its 500, 400 to 500 passengers um, sank into Lake Michigan with all of the passengers on board. And the passengers, of course, scrambled for their lives. Not many of them were able to find life jackets. I don't know that those were required, you know, at that period in time. Uh, but as the ship went down, those who were able and grabbed something in the water to try to float. One man who survived floated back to the shore eventually. This happened actually as the Lady Elgin was very close to the shores, not too far offshore from Chicago. But um, one man survived holding on to a snare drum that had also gone into the water. You can picture riding a snare drum to safety. Another lady survived holding on to a table that all she was able to do was grab the legs or the top of the table, but she held on for life and actually survived it. Of the passengers that were on that ship that day, most of them did not survive. One of the other problems, big problems, was that after the storm or as a part of the storm, as this happened at, in the nighttime and it happened in September, the waters were, Lake Michigan is never terribly warm, you know, but it's warmer in September than it is in January. And uh, after about six hours, as morning came, the people who were near the shore could see passengers and debris and all of the things from this shipwreck that had been driven towards the shore. But one of the big problems with the waves and with the storm was that the waves had caused near the shore a tremendous undertow in the water. So if you got down just a little bit into the water, you would be drawn back out into the, into the uh, lake. In fact, those who were on the shore and those who picked up bodies say that between 100 and some estimates say 200 of the people who found something to hang on to, to head towards shore as morning arrived about six hours later, that between one and 200 of them actually drowned because of the waves and because of the undertow within 100 feet of shore. You know, it looks like you're going to make it. You can see the land but you can't reach it because of the rocks and the undertow and the waves and the wind and everything that was happening. There were um, less than 100 people who survived. 60 people were picked up by a tugboat and saved out in the waters. And there were 30 people, that's all there were from the ship, that actually made it to shore themselves. One of those on that snare drum, one holding onto that table I mentioned, uh, one of the interesting things as a part of that story is that a man by the name of Edward Spencer came early in the morning out to the lake front and saw what was going on. Edward Spencer was a frail young man who was there in the Chicago area and he was studying for the ministry. The other thing that he had, uh, which was very useful at this point in time, was a background in swimming and he was a very strong swimmer. And as he saw what was happening out in the water, he saw a lady out in the water and knew that she was not going to make it to shore. And he took off all of the clothes that he could spare to take off and dove into the water and swam out through the undertow area, struggled for five minutes to reach her and finally reached her and pulled her back into safety. And then a short time after he pulled her back to the shore, he saw another. And he dove in and went out and got a, a second one, and then a third one, and then a fourth one, and then six, and then eight, and then ten. And hour after hour, when he saw an individual, he would go to their rescue. He became very exhausted. In fact, he did this for almost six hours. And he pulled in person after person after person until he had pulled in 17 people of the 30 who survived and made it to shore and were picked up by the tugboat out in the water. So of the 30 people, he personally rescued 17 of them, but it took its toll on him. When he was finished, he was so exhausted and so beat that he never really physically um, came back to himself. He never regained his full strength. He eventually gave up his classwork, gave up going into ministry, 
moved to California and settled on a fruit farm where he eked out a living over the years to come into his older age before he died. Before he died, a reporter came to him and said, can you tell us, please tell us, Mr. Spencer, we, we're wanting to know some of the details of that event. And so he shared with them. And numerous stories have been written, but he shared with them his experiences and what happened and the people. And, and as they finished their interview, they said to him, of all the memories you have of that event, what stands out in your mind the most? And he said, the one thing that stands out in my mind the most is that of the 17 people I saved, not one of them ever wrote or came to me or said thank you for saving their lives. You know, what a pity. What a shame. You would think that at least one or two of them, wouldn't you? In fact, I would think all 17 of them would have said to him, thank you, on the shore or after they got in or written him or looked him up or some point in time, come back to say thank you for what you did. But so often, that's the way it is. We do good things to help people. And often, even if they are thankful, they don't come back and say thank you. The Lord experienced that too. Take your Bible. Go to Luke 17 for a moment here. And notice, Jesus had this experience. It's the story of the ten lepers who were cleansed. And notice Luke chapter 17, starting here, we will, in verse 11, and reading through this story. It says, Now it happened, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then, as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. I don't know if you've ever done any study into leprosy or what it's like, the disease. You probably have some knowledge of it from Bible stories and sermons and other things. I had an uncle who, for about 20 years, was a missionary in Africa at Malamula, which is our Adventist leper colony, where they had up to 300 uh, lepers at a time that would be there. And leprosy is a terrible disease. Now today it's curable. We know its roots. We have antibiotics that will help stop the disease, arrest it. But in Jesus' day it wasn't. Um, if, you, if you've done any study, it, it, attacks, it attacks the nervous system and the body begins to deteriorate. You know, the, the feeling goes away and injuries happen. Fingers will eventually rot off. Noses, ears uh, will disappear. Uh, from faces of a leper who's in the advanced stages. And it's a horrendous way to die. And for that reason, in Bible days, lepers were separated from the community because it can be passed on by contact if you don't have sanitary measures and other things going on to, to prevent it. But it says here that there were 10 of them and they stood afar off. And verse th 13 says, they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned. And with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face, on his feet, and gave him, Jesus that is, thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not Ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except for this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. You know, Jesus appreciates hearing us say thanks to him as well. It isn't just you and I who appreciates somebody who cares. Jesus also appreciates it when we give thanks. And Desire of Ages, page 191, indicates that it makes a difference to him when he hears from us our praise, our thanksgiving, our appreciation for the things that he has done and the blessings we receive. It says, our Redeemer thirsts for recognition. He hungers for the sympathy and love of those whom he has purchased with his own blood. 
He longs with inexpressible desire that they should come to him and have life. As the mother watches for the smile of recognition from her little child, which tells of the dawning of intelligence, so does Christ watch for the expressions of gratitude and grateful love which show that spiritual life has begun in the soul. Jesus looks down and he says, oh, look, it is so wonderful that this individual or that individual has begun to recognize the blessings that I am giving and is saying thankful, thank you for the things that they appreciate that I am doing. And it makes a difference to him. And my purpose today, as we spend a few more minutes yet together, is not to give you some insight, you know, that you'd never hear somewhere else, or uh, focus and dig deep into some specific Bible passage. But what I want to do today is just remind us and set in front of our memories and our thinking some of the many areas that the Lord has been at work and ways in which he has blessed us. You have been blessed. I know you have. And we all know that, but we sometimes forget, and we often neglect to say thank you. So what I'm hoping to do is just to stimulate each one of us to think, and then to whisper personally and quietly and sincerely, thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done for me. There are so many ways and so many things for which and in which we could give thanks. So many blessings we have that we, we seldom think about. Um, things for which we could and, and should say, thank you, Lord, from the bottom of my heart. I really appreciate it. And that's something that we will focus on one day you know, of this week. But we ought to do it more than one day. We ought to look at what the Lord has done and what he continues to do. And so I'm going to today just share with you a few things, a short list of things that I'm thankful for in the hopes that it'll jog your memory on some of the things that you are thankful for. And, you know, it wouldn't, wouldn't hurt to make a written list now or later, you know, or at Thanksgiving Day or sometime of the things which you're thankful for to just slip in your Bible or have on your dresser or in your bedroom somewhere that, in the kitchen that reminds you of the things and the ways which the Lord has blessed. Um, what am I thankful for today? Well, first of all, I guess I would say number one, I'm thankful to be here as a, as a pastor, to be here in your presence today. You know, that's a blessing to me. Uh, it's good once you've retired to not just speak once here and then come back a year later and speak at that church again when the pastor's gone, but to have a few days to get acquainted with a group, a church, and to meet people and to get to know them. And I've appreciated getting to know you. I know that uh, David and Amy, when they moved to uh, uh, Upper Michigan, didn't initially tell the conference they'd go right away. In fact, they told them three times, no, we're not going, okay, before David said, we are convinced, 100% convinced, that this is what the Lord wanted us to do. He spoke clearly to us. And after the third no, he spoke to us, you know, and, and we were convinced that he was saying, yeah, you need to do this. And so they left. But I know they like being here. And you have been uh, warm, friendly, you know, uh, kind in, in so many ways. I, I've appreciated getting to know you. And it's a blessing to be here more than just one Sabbath and then gone, you know, and get to oh, eat with you at potluck and meet, meet your leaders and just uh, get to know you. And that's a blessing, and I appreciate that. I guess the second thing on my list, and most of you can't say I'm putting that number one on my list because, you know, if you thought the Lord was telling you he wanted you up here every week behind the pulpit, you would not see that as a blessing. <laughs> Some of you would see that as a curse. <laughs> but uh, it is good to have the friends, to make the friends. But the second thing, probably most of you could put very high on your list, I'm thankful for my family, <clears throat> for parents, who are actually, in my case, now both dead, for a wife of 45 years, for children, for an extended family and relatives beyond that. What a difference they have made in my life. And I appreciate them. And I know that you often, when you think of what you are thankful for, 
would probably put your spouse, your kids, your parents, your, some of your close friends very high on that list. But that's something we need to be thankful for and tell the Lord, and at times, perhaps, tell them that we are thankful for as well. Third, I'm thankful for just life, for God's protection. When I think of being alive, one of the things I think about is this uh, article that was on the front page of our union paper a few years ago, in fact, many years ago, uh, as I was pastoring. I, I read the front of the union paper, and the front page says, Parachutist survives fall, makes deep depression in the earth. Now, that would get your attention and get you to want to read that article immediately, wouldn't it? This is the story that I, I think of occasionally about a young 22-year-old woman named Deborah who was evidently doing skydiving and taking some classes on how to do that and being prepared to do it on her own. And of her initial graduation jump, where she jumped out of the plane at 3,000 feet up above Pennsylvania and pulled the cord on her parachute, and it did not open. Now, every person who's done any skydiving or had any parachute training knows that you don't panic at a time like that, but you look for your reserve parachute, right? Because everybody who jumps has a reserve in case it doesn't open. And so she fumbled and looked, and as she's going down, she pulled the cord on her reserve chute, and it did not open. And so within 20 seconds, she had fallen the 3,000 feet and hit the ground on her feet, smacked into the earth, left a depression in the cornfield one foot deep. And the article says that she had both of her lungs collapse, her back and her pelvis and several ribs were, ribs were broken, and her coccyx, which is your tailbone, was shattered. Ligaments were ripped. Her nerves and her internal organs suffered severe trauma. The first responders who came to the site where she was at kept anybody who knew her, who were watching her at graduation jump, or anybody who had had any relationship with her from going to the site. They would not allow them to go out where they saw her land because they knew what they expected to find, they expected to pick up parts and pieces, and they didn't want the family seeing that. And so they hustled out to where she was at, and miracle of miracles, she was still alive. She was unconscious. In fact, she was in shock for two, week, for two days and on a critical list for five days, but they rushed her into an ambulance, rushed her into the hospital, and she lived, believe it or not. The only known case of somebody living from a non-opening parachute and hitting the ground in that whole part of America. But she lived. She spent a uh, number of weeks in the hospital, as you might imagine, 10 weeks in fact, four weeks of intense physical therapy, and then she walked out of our Adventist hospital in Pennsylvania, able to continue to function and beginning to look for a job, and is doing well today. Now, none of you have had that experience, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, I did have a buddy who said he jumped out of the airplane in Vietnam as a parachutist, and his chute didn't open, and he survived, because on the way down, he managed to catch and hold on to the leg of another buddy whose parachute did open. But uh, So he was quite thankful for that. And I don't have anything that compares to that story. But I do think that the Lord tried to take my life. I mean, I'm sorry, let me word that totally different. I do think that the devil tried to take my life just a few years ago when I was pastoring Battle Creek. Um, it was uh, December 27, my granddaughter's birthday, so I remember the date real well. And I was the pastor in Battle Creek, and we had a member who had died who had relatives and also a funeral plot in Goebbels. And so I was on my way two days after Christmas to do a funeral service, driving from Battle Creek to Goebbels. And as I was driving there, 
I was, I was on I-94 going 70 miles an hour. Actually, if truth be known, I might have been going slightly over 70 miles an hour on my way to this funeral. It had snowed. There was some snow on the sides. But uh, the roads were wet, but, but basically clear. Um, and I was driving along on the freeway and just coming up behind and starting to pass a truck, just at the tail end of the truck, when some car came on the entrance ramp of exit 79 and pulled in behind that truck, and then without looking, pulled out immediately to pass the truck without seeing if anybody was in the lane beside him. And there was I in the lane beside him. And he bumped me, and, and I swerved over, but I was at the spot on the freeway in Kalamazoo where there aren't any shoulders, really. There's about three foot there, and concrete barrier, because they had to put another lane in, and they wanted three lanes going through that part, Kalamazoo. And so as I pulled over, I went into the snow that was on the side a little bit and then pulled back. And I remember to this day fishtailing and trying to correct how you do when you're in a skid, you know, about three times. And I went this way, that way, and this way. And then I went into the uh, concrete barrier in the center of the freeway. And then, after taking off, not taking off, but taking the wheel off the axle and two, wheel, two wheels that didn't steer well, my car swerved and I went slowly back across the freeway, not slowly, but probably 40 miles an hour or something, back across the freeway with all the traffic that's coming into the guardrail on the other side of the freeway. And went into the guardrail, skidded along for, I don't know what it was, 50 or 70 feet or something, and came to a stop at that spot. As I came to the stop, you know, I, I looked in the mirror, and there I was still alive. And <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I remember taking the seatbelt off and beginning to open the door and get out. And the young man who had been driving in that car and was uh, behind me, he pulled up behind me. In fact, turned out he didn't have a license, and the insurance that he gave the cop was not good either as we got to that point in the story, but that's another story. But anyway, he came running up as I opened the door and hopped, and he said, are you okay? And you know, to this day, I count that as a miracle. First of all, that I wasn't hurt. The, seat, the uh, angle I hit, the uh, airbag didn't even go off, but I took out both wheels and the whole front end of the car and totaled it, and uh, never had even a bruise or a bit of pain from even the seatbelt that was covering me as I smacked into that cement embankment there. And I believe to this day that God said, I'm not done with him yet to Satan. I still need him in this work. I pulled over, and I called my wife, and I said, I've just been in an accident and totaled the car. Can you come and get me? She ran out of the house, jumped into our van, drove to that part of Kalamazoo, took her about 20 minutes, just as they had loaded my car onto the flatbed and hauled it off, and I jumped into the van. In fact, she ran out so quick, all she had on was her slippers. She didn't even bandage to put on shoes. But I got in the van, and I drove to Goebbels, and I did the funeral. And I never told them. I just totaled my car on the way over. I figured they had enough to worry about. And they found out several weeks later and said, we just discovered you totaled your car on the way, because they told my church what had happened. And the word got back, and they said, you totaled your car on the way to our funeral. It wasn't my funeral, <laughs> but it was the one I was doing for them. But, you know, I believe that the Lord spared my life. Now, that's something that a lot of you can relate to and probably have even the same types of stories you could tell me or share with somebody else. Because you have seen or been in those types of circumstances one way or another yourselves. But I am thankful for life, for God's protection, for his presence in my life. And it's something that I shouldn't take for granted, and I ought to tell him thank you for more often than just immediately after the accident happens or, or doesn't happen, as the case may be. God has blessed us. There are so many things, and we're moving right along time-wise here. In fact, we're after 12. You've probably already figured that out. But just a few more here, and we'll go quickly through those. But I'm, I'm thankful for the country we live in. How about you? Are you thankful to be born in America? And what a blessing. Do you realize we are born into, grow up in, live in the country that most of the world would like to come to if they could? This is where they would like to live if they had that choice. Religious liberty, democracy, to be born as an American citizen and live in this country. What a blessing. Something we ought to be more thankful for than often what we are. I'm thankful, number six, for the material blessings that God has given me. 
you have the same thing, you know. You don't think you're blessed with material blessings. Go home and look in your closet. Just how many dresses or pants or shirts or pairs of shoes do you really need, you see? Uh, we are blessed way beyond what we ought to be. In other countries that I visited, sometimes on mission trips, in Bible days when clothes were handmade, often all people had was the clothes on their back and maybe one other set. They didn't have the wardrobes, but we could go into material possessions indefinitely. A roof over our head, the type of house we live in. As I compare my house with the huts that I saw in Kenya, Papua New Guinea, numerous other places, they are so thankful for this one room shack with a straw or woven wolf over, roof over it, over their heads. And they feel they are blessed. When I was in the Philippines, you know, we had a two-story hut, and they had a mat that they slept on on the floor every night. I mean, literally a mat that you would call a rug is all it was. It wasn't a mattress. It was a rug uh, that they slept on. So many blessings. Uh, microwave. <laughs> Are you thankful for just that? And that's come into existence just in my lifetime. I can fix a meal, a warm meal, quicker than my parents ever thought of, you know. Uh, but those appeared. Uh, indoor toilets. You know, if you really think about it, you might even add to that list, if you visit some of the countries I visited, soft toilet paper. <laughs> uh, you could go so far into this list. Warm water. I mean, the day and age in which we live. The automobile that you drive. How long it takes you to get. 20 miles down the road. I mean, what a blessing to have the material possessions to live at the time in this earth's history in which we live. There are so many. Uh, number seven, the food on my table. Are you blessed? Are you about to starve today? <laughs> there have been times in my life when money was more scarce than other times, and you might be there right now. But none of us is suffering to the point where we're about to starve in this country. Uh, grocery stores that you go to just to buy it. You don't even have to raise it and can it and preserve it these days to have good quality food. What a blessing. And we forget to say thank you so often. The story is told of a farmer, a country farmer, who came into the city one time. And as he came into the city, he went at lunchtime to eat in a restaurant. And as he went to eat, he ordered his meal. And when it came, he bowed his head and closed his eyes and said a quiet, silent thank you to the Lord and appreciation for the food that he was about to eat. When he opened his eyes, there were four young punks at a table next to him who wanted to make him feel guilty about that. And they looked over at him and they said, hey, farmer, does everybody do that in the country in which you live, where you came from? And he quietly looked at him and he said, no, the pigs just dig right in and eat. <laughs> you know, uh, and that's true. We need to stop. We need to say thank you. And the prayers we say before our meals ought not to be routine. They ought to be genuine every time, saying, God, thank you for all the provision, for what I have, for your blessings, in just what we have to eat. There are so many things. Number eight, peace, forgiveness, freedom from sin and guilt. Here's David in Psalms 32. He says, blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is, is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, David says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For night and day your hand was heavy upon me and my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. What a blessing to know that even though I have done things which I should not have done or acted in ways in which I should not have acted, I am forgiven. I can be saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. Number nine, the Bible 
I am thankful for the written word of God. What a blessing to have this book. You know, for 95% of the world's history, men and women have longed to have something like this. And only within the last few years, maybe 100 years, have we had the potential to have the Bible in so many translations. I have more than I ever read. And you may too. The problem is that so often we don't read it at all. But what a blessing to have access to God's Word. A Christian education, number 10. only have 12 of them, so hold with me here. Christian education, number 10. I really appreciate my parents who put me in a Christian school. I appreciate my teachers, you know, and, and what they have done for me as well. Number 11. Sabbath school teachers, I still remember some things from Sabbath school, believe it or not. That was a long time ago. I mean, children's Sabbath school here. Uh, Sabbath school teachers, church school teachers, um, relatives who played a part in my upbringing. You know, my parents, as I was growing up, they, they said, I don't know how we're going to get you through college, but somehow we'll do it. And they did. And today I've had 43 years of ministry. My younger brother uh, is just wrapping up his career as an emergency room physician. I don't know how that ever managed to even pay for the tuition for those things in the education. But I'm thankful for those who shaped my life, for teachers, for relatives. I'm probably a pastor today because I had an uncle, the one I mentioned who was a missionary for 20 years at Malamula. He was a pastor as well. And he used to come visit us and he would say, I'm going to teach you how to preach. You know, and so he'd say, okay, here's how we do it. Now get out and preach to us. And I would do whatever I did back at those early years, of four and three and four and five maybe. Uh, he told me later, he said, uh, you know, I, I used to teach you how to preach, but then you would want me to do that so often that I got really um, sometimes bored with doing that. You know? And I would come to him, he said, you would come all the time. You'd say, uncle, teach me how to preach. And he said, sometimes I'd just say, no, we'll do that later, or we've already done that once. And I would go, if you aren't going to teach me how to preach, how am I ever going to be a preacher? <laughs> so he probably planted the idea in my mind that that was something I could do. He was a preacher, I could too, and I came to accept that that was God's will for my life, his plan. And I thank those who have shaped my life. And last, number 12, here on my list, my short list for today, I'm thankful for the remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church and the truths that we know and understand and hold. What a difference it makes to be a part of a church that has the whole picture put together and understands the beginning from the end, keeps the Sabbath. What a blessing the Sabbath is. Knows that what happens at death. What a blessing of clear understanding of that is. Knows what the future holds in the second coming and what the Lord is going to do one day very soon as he returns. What a privilege to be born for me into a Seventh-day Adventist family in the country of America. And you might not have been born, perhaps you have stepped out and made the choice and become a part later in life of the Seventh-day Adventist church. But what a blessing we have the privilege of having God's hand in our lives and these blessings that we experience. And I guess I would add maybe one more today, and that is that I am thankful for the love of God and the gift of Jesus and the guidance of the Holy Spirit because it makes all the difference. And what we want to do is to remember to say thank you. Thanksgiving Day would be a great time to do it, Sabbath is a great time to do it. But it's a habit that we ought to get into. And it ought to be done more often than once a week or once a year. It ought to be done often and sincerely. And it will make a difference and be appreciated by our God. Let's make a habit of saying thank you to our God. To God be the glory for great things he has done. We're going to close with hymn number 341.